Perry was the, is the 14th Secretary of Energy. He was, for 14 years, governor of the state of Texas, and in his second year speaking at CIRA Week. We're really very pleased to welcome Secretary Perry back to join us today and welcome him to the platform. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Uh, Dan Jurgen, thank you very much. It's a, uh, it's a great privilege to uh, uh, be here today with, uh, with all of you. And uh, we, a little bit ago, I had the opportunity to meet Rebecca, uh, his beautiful darling, and a very smart lawyer uh, that uh, operates out of, of Washington, D.C. And, and she, uh, her, her youth and her exuberance reminded me of, of a, a humorous story. My, uh, my daughter, who's now, oh, I think probably 33 years old and married and uh, quite a young lady in her own right in her uh, grade school. I was the agriculture commissioner in one of my previous lives, and we were living in Austin. And most people in Texas didn't know we even had an agriculture commissioner, much less who it was. So I was just another government worker in, in Austin, Texas, and my children went to school at the public schools there. And, and they had, um, Dan, they had this, tell us what your parents do day at school. And the little girls got up and talked about her father, who was the, the police officer and what he did, and another one who was a doctor. And they came to Sydney. And they said, Sydney, what does your father do? And she deadpan looked him right in the eye and said, he talks. <laughs> so in the spirit of my daughter and, and what I do for a living, I, I'm going to share with you a little bit, uh, those of you who are here for Sarah Week, uh, you know, welcome back to Texas. Uh, you know, when I was governor of, of, of this great state, uh, I, I got to tell you, best job in the world was being the, the governor of the state of Texas. Now, as the secretary of, of, of energy, I got the coolest job in the world. <laughs> uh, and, 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 it, and it comes from having this front row seat um, to, to some of the most astonishing examples of, of cutting edge innovation. And, and, and having seen, I mean, literally modern miracles, I believe we have to reaffirm innovation as the great engine of, of progress, which it, it offers this wondrous, I should say not one, it offers wondrous choices and, and opportunities right here in the United States and literally around the globe at our incredible national labs. I mean, there are 17 of these incredible labs. They've decoded DNA. They've helped kickstart the development of, of the World Wide Web. They brought us safe waters to places around the world that didn't have it. They pioneered nuclear safety modeling. They assisted in the shell gas revolution, sped up the detection of the Ebola virus, ignited the LED revolution. And today, residing in our national labs are the two most powerful supercomputers in the world and five of the ten fastest computers. These, these powerful machines, they have the potential to unlock artificial intelligence, providing scientists and, and researchers the ability to quickly analyze massive data sets for answers to the world's most complex problems. And as you all well know, 
it's already proven to be a magnificent tool in the energy sector. Today at DOE, we're leveraging artificial intelligence insights to optimize grid security, resiliency, to increase energy efficiency in our homes and our businesses, and to ensure that our nuclear deterrent is safe and effective. But what you may not know about the DOE-fueled artificial intelligence is the accelerating pace of discovery in healthcare. That may catch you by surprise. We're improving treatments for everything from cancer to traumatic brain injury. We're helping to fight the opioid epidemic in this country. AI has the potential to literally transform every aspect of the world as we know it. You know, I, I'm incredibly excited about what just the next year of AI innovation will bring to us. You remember when we, when we met last year, uh, I spoke about what I called the, um, the new energy realism. And now, through this cascade of innovation, we're producing a wider, well, a wider range of fuels, more abundantly, more affordably. We're using them more cleanly, more efficiently than ever. And, and I, last year I noted how President Trump's all of the above energy strategy was accelerating our progress. Since that time, our progress has continued, and, and we're approaching the dawn of what I call the new American energy era, an era of vastly improved energy choice for the, for the entire world, where we embrace new and, and smarter ways to reach our energy and our environmental goals. I mean, it's, to me, this is the most fascinating time uh, to live maybe in, in human history. And, and the signs of this new era are everywhere. Over, over the past two years, innovation has expanded our solar energy by nearly 90%. And it's done the same with our wind energy. As a matter of fact, this year, Wind energy will exceed hydropower generation for the first time ever. And you knew you were going to have to hear a little bit of Texas pride out of this. Texas now produces 15% of its total energy from wind and solar. That is more percentage-wise, than our friends in Europe. Yes. You've been surpassed, Europe, by Texas. <laughs> you know, last year at this time, the U.S. was the world's number one natural gas producer. Now, we're the world's number one oil producer as well. And between now and 2025, the United States will contribute an estimated one half of all the world's growth in oil and gas production. I mean, th th those are some stunning statistics. Recently, we um, were joined <clears throat> um, by uh, Cutter Petroleum and by ExxonMobil. Uh, for their announcement of a joint investment, exceeding over $10 billion for an export terminal um, in, in the southeastern part of Texas called Golden Pass. That's one investment, one investment alone that has the ability to generate nearly $35 billion in economic gains. It, uh, that's over the life of that project, but an estimated 45,000 direct 
and indirect jobs. We've got a number of other projects coming online that will increase our LNG export capacity by 150% over last year. Three projects already that are expected to be exporting later this year. Today, we export American LNG into 34 countries, spanning five continents. U.S. coal exports had their second best year ever. And we expect to become a net energy exporter next year. And I might add, for the next 30 years. So it's thanks to innovation. We've got more than enough energy to share with the world, to share with, with our friends. And, and, and with that energy comes freedom of choice for energy consumers everywhere, including places where it had never existed before. For those countries, choice means this. If they were bound to just one nation for their energy needs, they are bound no more. If, if they were restricted to just one energy source for those needs, they are restricted no more. And that's just the beginning. Whether as consumers of U.S. products, or for that matter, whether they're producers themselves. We want other countries to benefit from the innovation technology that is unleashed by our energy abundance. What we offer is true energy choice. It's born out of innovation and marked by a diversity of supply of of, of nations providing that supply and of routes to deliver that supply. Across the world, energy choice will strengthen energy security, it will strengthen economic security and their national security. And along with energy choice, the United States supports competitive markets, the rule of law, and the sanctity of contracts. We uphold the, the transparency, the transparency of, of energy deals. We oppose using energy to coerce any nation. And that's why we oppose the construction of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline and the Turkish Stream pipelines. You know, in my travels abroad, the discussion about equating energy security with national security is especially welcomed. Last September when I was in, in Bucharest, Romania, and we had the Three Cs Summit, we took a big step forward by announcing a groundbreaking initiative with like-minded European countries. It's called the Partnership for Transatlantic Energy Cooperation. We call it PTEC. But working with our sister agencies in Washington, key policymakers in Europe, we seek to build upon our European alliances to advance economic prosperity by strengthening energy security and promoting transparency. And I might add, transparent trade. <laughs> I'm proud to announce that tomorrow, PTEC will gather for the first time right here in Houston, and I will address and hear from member nations who share our commitment to energy diversity and national security. The underpinnings of our energy achievements can also be applied to other challenges most notably our efforts to improve the quality of our air and our water. For decades, 
Some have claimed that we are running out of resources like oil. That, and it, 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 even if we weren't, we'll destroy our environment if we keep producing them. In response to these assertions, innovation has spoken and it's refuted them completely. We are not running out of energy. We are producing it more abundantly than ever and more cleanly as well. Just ask Dr. Fatih Barreau, the head of the IEA, who recently said that we're reducing energy related to emissions. Our reductions are the largest ever recorded. And the way we did it is clear. Through the, no, I should say, not through the onerous regulations of the Paris Accord, but by continued innovation in our science-driven labs and by people like you in this room. And as a result, we are not constricting energy choice. We are preserving and expanding it. Rather than driving down emissions that produce, or I should say, driving down fuels that produce emissions, we're driving down emissions while producing those same fuels. And, and because we did, we can lead the world in reducing electricity from fuels with near zero emissions. I'm delighted that, that we have, and we're seeing this newfound passion in many corners of the world for pursuing cleaner energy. And, you know, while it might be easy to call someone a, a critic because we don't agree on a, a cause or, or share the, uh, the, the same approach to solving a challenge, I prefer to call them competitors. <laughs> That's because I believe that when competing ideas are discussed and debated, we open the door to progress. And so I, I'm constantly amazed by the lack of discussion around the progress that we're already making, that we've already made. We need more open and candid discussions. We need a healthy competition of ideas on energy and the environment. And instead of banning certain ideas simply because they don't meet someone else's narrative. And as part of that discussion, we need to face reality. We need to embrace, not reject, the science and the evidence that support the smart technologies that are out there that are driving emissions down, like nuclear energy. Nuclear energy. <laughs> they don't even produce those emissions to begin with. Embrace those. From carbon capture utilization and energy storage to small modular nuclear reactors, we need to support more innovation, not less of it. We need to apply that innovation to expand our energy usage and, and create real-world progress, like bringing that life-changing benefit from electricity to the world's poorest people who are trapped in energy poverty. Those aren't just sound bites. They are genuine challenges that we can tackle. Energy independence used to be a sound bite. But now it's reality. Curtailing it would erase today's great economic gains and environmental achievements while limiting tomorrow's innovative solutions to our biggest challenges. So as we look to the future, I know that despite our challenges, everyone in this room is as excited and as optimistic as I am about the incredible potential of the new era that we're entering. If we continue to be inclusive, not exclusive, 
if, if we keep saying yes to competition and choice, our optimism will be richly rewarded. This is the new American energy era, and it will move us forward, bringing unprecedented benefit to the world, unleashing greater innovation than ever so that sovereign nations can share in the prosperity, the freedom, and the security for generations and generations to come. Thank you, and God bless you for being here today. Thank you, Mr. That was, that was great. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I was thinking, uh, f thanks for that wonderful speech and that very inclusive and comprehensive speech. I was thinking if your daughter was back in third grade today and they asked what uh, you do for a living, instead of uh, saying that you talk, she might say, quoting you, that you're America's number one energy salesman. Uh, <laughs> what are you out there selling? <laughs> well, and, 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 and she would be correct in, in that sense. And, and, uh, and, and again, thank you all for, for coming and being here today. This is a, a, a great reflection of, uh, of what a fascinating time to be in the energy uh, sector. I suspect, as a matter of fact, I know that uh, every sector of the, uh, um, of, of, the, of the energy world is represented here today from fossil fuels all the way through uh, our renewables and, and uh, the, the nuclear world. Uh, we're blessed to have uh, Minister Asrui here with us uh, from the UAE and uh, Secretary O. Nali from Mexico, thank you both for, for being here today and, and uh, so many folks from across the world. And I have, I have, I have been, uh, uh, I am a traveling salesman. And uh, as I've been to uh, certainly their countries multiple times and so many others as we go and we, uh, we, we share the story about American uh, energy innovation and, and Mr. Hunt, uh, you and Hunter, who have been involved in, in this industry for, for so long and been so successful with it, uh, it's the private sector and our innovators uh, that uh, I tip my hat to very often. And so um, as, I'll tell you one little quick snippet story. The first time I, I represented the United States outside of the country as the Secretary of Energy, we went to Rome, uh, Dan, for the G7. And uh, we, we, we were not quite out of the Paris Accord, but I was pretty sure we were headed that way. And uh, so I had a number of my friends from the European uh, side of things that came up to me and you know, were kind of giving me what for, that uh, you can't leave the Paris Accord. <laughs> and, and I was polite and shook my head and thank you for the advice. Um, but <laughs> then we would go into the, to the bilats and the doors would be closed. How about buying some of that LNG you guys got? Yeah. <laughs> huh? And that's music to my ears because if we're going to be serious about reducing emissions in the world, being able to go, uh, Dr. Mahdi, to, to India and share the abundant uh, resource of natural gas that we have in this country, or you know, you, you all may decide to, uh, to to get it from somewhere else. But the point is, having multiple uh, opportunities to buy multiple fuels from multiple sources through multiple routes, that is a great story for the world. If we're going to be serious about the 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 climate, then we have to 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 be realistic and say that it's the transition over to LNG. It's uh, using uh, our, our nuclear, it's using our renewables in a, in a combined way. I'm proud of what America has done over the course of the last um, decade when it comes to reducing the emissions that we've seen. And the rest of the world can enjoy that and see that as well. So. Selling our innovation along with our product, and our product came to us because of innovation. That, that was the point I hope I, 
I, I was able to make here. We're where we are today because of innovators, because of the George Mitchells of the world, who, who although the conventional wisdom said you can't do it, they weren't persuaded to quit. And if that's the, that's the great message of the world's energy innovators, the world's energy producers, is if we will not be persuaded to quit. So, Mr. The world will be a better place. I'm sorry, I'm totally filibustered. No, down. no. I apologize. I... It leads right to the next question. <laughs> You've described the new American energy era. There's this other formulation out there called the Green New Deal. Uh, how does what, what the Department of Energy doing to address the actual agenda? Yeah, and, and I hope you picked up in my remarks that, uh, listen, I, I think having a conversation about uh, the, the Green New Deal is a, is a good thing, and to do it in a thoughtful and a, and a polite and a uh, respectful way, uh, just because somebody doesn't agree with what I believe in or I don't agree with their, their outtake doesn't mean we don't need to continue to have the conversation. I think it's wise for us to have those, those conversations. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the fact is by 2040, 70 percent of the Earth's electricity is still going to be produced by fossil fuels. How do we do it? Sakul and I have been working on carbon capture utilization uh, on the clean energy ministerial. Uh, it's, it's having partners like him around the world who on the face, people might look at it and go, well, wait a minute, you guys are in the fossil fuel business. No, we're in the energy business and we're in the clean energy business. And here are some of the technologies that we can bring to uh, to bring to India, that we can bring to, to China, uh, and allow them to enjoy not only more affordable, accessible energy, but do it in a cleaner way as well. So there's a lot to be achieved here. I mean, when you look at it all, and you've been so immersed in this, what do you think is actually, would you say, is the biggest challenge to realizing this energy potential we have as a country? Um, Getting the product to market, I would suggest to you, is the biggest challenge that we have. And uh, so, you know, what does that mean? A lot of people go, well, that means being able to get it out of the, uh, the Permian Basin, get it to the Gulf Coast, and then get it to India. And they would be correct. But there's an issue that goes back before any of those, and I'm looking at uh, one of the solutions right here in the audience. Bernie Macme. He's on the FERC. He's right there. Permits. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and all, in all seriousness, I mean, it's, it's, uh, I pick on Bernie. Bernie is a, is a great and a good and friend, and thank God he's... Uh, um, he's, he's on the commission now, and we got his nomination approved. But we have two spots still open. And I think <clears throat> getting that FERC to its full contentious, contention, uh, if, if you will, uh, so that they can move and move with the expedition, there are literally tens of billions of dollars worth of projects uh, 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 that, that can be built in the United States and around the world that's going to affect our future economy, not just in the United States, but literally the world. So uh, I think it's very important for us to snap, snap, get these, uh, get these appointments done, get them out so they can get to work. Uh, we got work to do in the world, and, and uh, uh, this isn't just about the United States. It's not uh, just about our economy. It's about being able to, uh, those of you who represent other parts of the world, I hope you'll be if you have the opportunity to talk to uh, someone in government, just uh, tell them it would be a great idea to have some FERC commissioners. Okay. Secretary Perry, uh, it's amazing in these few days you're spending with us here at Sear Week, you're traveling, in effect, all over the United States and all over the world. And I think everybody here thanks you both for joining us today with these great remarks and for your engagement uh, here and indeed your engagement around the okay. world. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Dan. Indeed. Thank you all. Thank you very much.
That was terrific. Thank you. And I should add that the, not only the secretary is here, but many of uh, the people he works with in the U.S. government are uh, here too, and we're glad to have them all here. So I just want to say that there are two plenaries that occur right now. One is uh, the next wave of LNG, and the other is in African investment. And tonight we have two great dinners. We have an all-conference dinner on women in energy and a dinner focused on investment in Africa. So thank you all very much.